Welcome to Ask Maureen, where we cover historical image analysis, genealogy, and how to work with your family photo collection. I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, and I'll try to answer your questions. Good afternoon. I'm Maureen Taylor, the photo detective. Thank you so much for joining me for today's episode of Ask Maureen. This is the September 2017 edition, now available on for listening on iTunes. So if you are want to drive and listen to a podcast, um, we've had some positive reactions to people telling me that they've been listening uh, within there while they're driving to work, which is great. So the news lately has been full of just tragic um, events. We've had forest fires out west. We've had um, the hurricanes down south and in the um, Caribbean, um, earthquakes in Mexico. And it just seems like, to me, people are just really struggling to... um, they're struggling to to maintain their their lives or put their lives back together, and that there really isn't time when you're struggling without a house and without food to save those precious pieces of family history. So today's a sort of special edition of the Ask Maureen, which is here we go. I'd like you to talk to talk a little bit about disaster preparedness which is basically scanning your photographs. Um, don't wait for the perfect moment. Do it when, do it as soon as possible. Um, I know that, you know, it's only a matter of time before I live in New England, before we get hit by another hurricane. Um, I can hear the winds of Tropical Storm Jose outside my windows while I'm talking to you. And they're not too bad, which is great. So we haven't had any heavy rains or flooding, but it's only a matter of time. Um, This is actually, I believe, the anniversary of the hurricane of 1938 um, here in New England, which was quite devastating. So the best thing that you can do to take care of your photographs and your family history is to scan them, back up those scans and save those family photos and that family history. Basically, don't let a disaster take away your family history. Now, scanning you can do with the, this new Google app. We're going to put that up there on the screen. Uh, it's free. I mean, certainly there's lots of apps out there for scanning. Uh, there's the Photo Mime, which I've used. Uh, there's a new one that I tried at uh, Memory Web, I believe it's called, that I tried at the FGF. FGS uh, conference. And there's also this free app from actually memory web stores your photographs on the web, but uh, the Google photo app is free and it works, I believe with Android and and Apple um, iPhones. And it's really easy to use. So if you have um, a collection of family photos and everybody has the app, then you can go through your family photos much quicker using this Google app. And then when you want to back up that those photographs, you know, if if there's a risk of your house being destroyed um, or your hard drive being ruined with weather, then it would be a good idea to use a cloud-based, and it's always a good idea to use a cloud-based um, backup system, such as I've used Mosey and it works just fine. I've used Backblaze. Um, Right now I have a Mac, so I'm using iCloud, which then syncs with all my other Apple products. Um, So I'm never without my files, which is very reassuring when I'm traveling. After a disaster strikes, um, there are things that you can do as well. And if you go to my blog, MaureenTaylor.com, there's an article called What You Can Do After the Disaster. And we've seen some articles lately of some people in Houston who have been uh, stringing a clothesline and using uh, clothespins to dry out their family photos. Um, You gotta be careful you don't um, damage the images further because they're wet. But when Hurricane Sandy hit a few years ago here on the East Coast, um, 
I have a photo hero and it's uh, Jeanette Von Houten and I will do a shout out to Jeanette. She's one of my Facebook friends. And I saw what she was doing um, after the storm. Now she had great personal losses, uh, property losses, and she was um, dealing with some elderly parents at the time. And yet her and a team of volunteers began picking up family photographs that they found on the street. And they worked with a couple of companies to uh, save those photographs. And if you find photographs on the street uh, after these storms and you pick them up and you save them, you can read about Jeanette in my blog and find out what you can do. Now, there is I did talk to a conservator after Sandy to talk about um, sort of proper handling of these things. And you want to wear a mask, for, for one, because you don't want to breathe in any mold spores. You want to... Um, Make sure you use clean water. Now, generally, conservators use distilled water, but clean tap water works as well, and you rinse them out, and then you can dry them. You can dry them on uh, window screens, or if you happen to have blotting paper, um, the people that are doing it in Houston uh, with the negatives, hanging them from the uh, the clothesline, that, that seems to work for them as well. You just want to be careful with what you're doing. Now, if you want, and we're gonna get rid of this, if I can, yep, there we go. We're gonna get rid of this one too. Doesn't wanna go away. Little glitches. So this is actually the image I wanna show. So we're gonna put that up there, maybe. Just wanna go. If you want more information on how to care for your family photographs, and definitely how to take care of them. There's a whole chapter on disaster preparedness in my Preserving Your um, your Family Photographs, which is available on my website, MaureenTaylor.com. And it's also available on Amazon and it's available as an ebook too. Now, I wanna talk just for a few minutes about uh, this photograph that I'm showing you here uh, in the middle. This is John Quincy Adams. And when I lecture, I mention to people that photographs, your family photographs are important to you. They, they, they're your pictures and you find them, you know, it's quite touching. There are birthdays like the consult I did last week, which was a, a baby's birthday party from about 1910. It was very cute. There were two cakes on the table. One was um, sort of vanilla and one was chocolate. Um, and all the babies were sitting around the table on their mom's laps. And it was a really cool photo. There are also photographs in your collection that may have more than personal family interests. There could be something like uh, a photograph collection I've been working on recently of some military photos and may, in fact, be the only known images of a particular um, military group in upstate New York. So I'm waiting to hear about that from a, a local curator. This guy on the screen is John Quincy Adams. And uh, just recently, within the last few weeks, um, a man was going through his parents' uh, photo collection. And an image, not this particular one, but another image of John Quincy Adams was in the collection. But basically, here's the story. So John Quincy Adams was good friends with another congressman, and he had a series of photographs taken, uh, daguerreotypes, which are those shiny reflective images. And he gave one of the daguerreotypes to his friend, the congressman, way back um, in the 1840s. That photograph stayed in the family collection just passed down, just rolled over from generation to generation until this great, great grandson, I believe it was, of the congressman went through his parents' collection and saw a photograph and thought, I don't really know who this person is, and then turned it over and saw a note saying it was a gift from John Quincy Adams. So in this case, a photograph in a family collection is actually uh, going to be auctioned at auctioned and it will bring probably in the several hundred thousand dollar range uh, when it finally is auctioned. So when you go through those family collections and you have those unidentified images and you're not sure who they are, 
just remember they may not be important to you, but they might be important historically to someone else. And it's always worth having me weigh in on the photo and see if I see anything that maybe you've missed. Because I hate when I hear a story uh, like I heard uh, last week. I uh, went to dinner with some people and they, they were sort of taught, we sort of talk about what I do and how I'm the photo detective and what does that mean? And then they sort of pale. And uh, someone said to me that after their parents had died, that they had gone through the family photo collection and they had divided it up into two piles. And I'm thinking the punchline of this is the two piles are because they've divided up the collection and each one is going to take some home. But in fact, what they did was they divided it up into two piles, photos that were identified and that they knew the people and photographs they didn't know. And they threw the other, they threw the unidentified pile away. And um, when I hear a story like that, I just pause and then they look at me and say, but you could have helped us identify those family photographs. And I say, yes, I could have. Um, so when you're thinking about your family photos, please don't toss um, the unidentified images and be wary because you might end up with a very valuable photograph in your collection. Now, here's a personal story that's kind of odd. I went to the grocery store uh, like last week or the week before, I forget when, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. And I'm walking through the parking lot to purchase some food. Um, I needed something for dinner. And I see these two guys talking over the over the, the car. The, tr the trunk of the car is facing me. And on the trunk is a box of stereographs, these nearly identical images. And I stopped and I said, those are stereographs. And they looked at me sort of oddly and they started to explain what a stereograph was. And of course I was like, yes, I, I know what a stereograph is, but why are we in the parking lot of the grocery store talking about stereographs and why do you have them on the back of your car? I got very sort of pushy with them. And and they were very fun. And, and we talked about photographs and we talked about photo history. And before I know it, I came home with, yes, a stack of stereographs. Um, I went through the box. Um, the guy made me an offer for the entire box of stereographs. And I said, no, I only needed a few. Uh, and I, I came up with some really comic ones uh, that they have in the booth that you'll see um, in the coming months in October in my Facebook feed. And I also hope you'll check out my Facebook um, and Instagram. We did a little video of photo detective tips for uh, September because it, September's theme was all about saving family um, history and saving family photos specifically. Now, October is all about uh, Family History Month. And so we'll have some tips about photographs and family history as well. Um, by the way, if you are planning to go to Roots Tech, which is by far the largest family history conference in the country, I think between 35 and 40,000 people went last year. Um, registration is open if you search Roots Tech 2018. Um, I'll be there. I'll have a booth and I'll be doing consults, but I'm also speaking about immigrant clues and photographs. So I hope you'll join me. Uh, some of the photo preservation tips that I shared this past month were things like separate moldy items from the rest of your collection. If you don't, that mold will spread to your other images and other documents. Mold is insidious. It, it gets everywhere. And I'm really allergic to it, which is very funny for as a former curator. You want to interview relatives using your family photographs because photos, um, as many people know, and you might know this as well, are natural story triggers. Now, you might not actually get the story that you think you're going to get. Um, the story trigger means they may talk to you about something related to the people in the photo, which is pretty good. Um, I talked about watermarking your images before you post them online using a website called umarkonline.com, and it's U as in the letter U. Uh, mark.com. 
And you want to tell the story of these images, even if it's just a really short caption. And if you decide to share them, um, just make sure they're watermarked. Just so, and I would, for a watermark, I would put my um, uh, email address, something that someone would contact you. And we have someone who has, let's see, we've got a long comment from Miriam uh, Phillips. Let's show some of these. Um, she says the comment about throwing out the photos of unidentified people really struck a chord. Years ago, after my father-in-law died, the family was going through boxes in the house, and my sister-in-law found a box of photos that had belonged to her mother. Because they were people probably only her mother would have known, my sister-in-law dumped all of the pictures in a garbage bag and threw them out. To this day, I regret not grabbing that bag and sticking it in the back of our car. I have stories like this. I was giving a conference somewhere in Chicago and somebody was in my lecture and they said that as they got in their car, they could see their neighbors throwing out a box of photographs and, and they regretted not grabbing it. Uh, it. It happens to all of us. Let's see, we've got, uh, oh, Amy has shared the Roots Tech uh, website, which is rootstech.org. If you are interested in going uh, to Roots Tech, you can go there and register. And Miriam has another question. Uh, she said, is it fine to scan in the photos themselves or is it better to work with the actual negatives? You can scan either. Um, and certainly there are ways which I uh, need to figure out how to show you to do that on the on the BeLive um, format here. But there are ways to use your phone to scan negatives um, to make them a positive but it's just as fine to do the originals. So either, as long as you have documented uh, those photographs, and you can see the, the sort of light changing over my face as the, the tree moves back and forth in front of my office. So thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I had a great conversation with Scott Fisher of Extreme Genes. I believe that episode airs next Monday on the Extreme Genes website. We talked about houses and photographs, and it's really fun to see a house in the background because that's either where your ancestors lived or where some of their friends lived, or you know, there's a whole story behind why you posed on the porch of that house. And we also talked uh, on his new Patreon site. I don't know if you know about that, but that's a subscription site where you where he can have a little radio program and you can sign up to to get uh, his special broadcast just for Patreon viewers. And we talked about reverse genealogy and photographs and how you um, instead of working from yourself back, you work from the image forward trying to find descendants. It's all part of that orphan photo movement that I'm so popular, um, so, so happy to participate in. So thank you so much for joining me today. Remember, this episode is available on iTunes for listening, and I'll be back next month on October 19th. Send your questions in through my Ask Maureen button on maureentaylor.com, and I look forward to chatting with you then. Thank you. Thank you for watching and listening. You can submit your questions for future episodes using the Ask Maureen button on MaureenTaylor.com or through any of my social media contacts. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as The Photo Detective and on Facebook at Maureen Photo Detective. I hope you'll come back for the next show. Don't forget to send me your questions. <laughs>